that. Carbs. Like it's a good segue okay. into into the new book, but let's bust a few diet myths, right? Okay. Like Quick macros, calorie counting, like come at me. Like I, I know you got a lot to say about this kind of thing. Uh, well, they exist, but uh, you know, their importance has been massively hyped. And the idea you can describe food by calories and by macronutrients has been exploited to the nth degree by the food companies. And that's why they can sell us all these products with these health claims on them. When we know they're rotten, they're artificial, you know, they're just, they're fake food. Mm -hmm. But because they have the right macronutrients on the label, they get a nice tick and we're, we're poisoning ourselves. So I think, you know, we haven't really changed in a hundred years our basic concept of how to discuss uh, nutrition uh, properly. And it, we're only just starting to get into this discussion of what ultra processed food is and the different levels of food processing, which the food industry doesn't want us to discuss because the last thing they want is some definition that they would have to mm -hmm. um, apply to. So they, they are keeping muddying the water on it. So the, the fact that they, you know, the, the companies, um, you know, I discuss this in the book, you know, love the idea of calories. They love calorie things on menus and they're describing food by its, it is as if you can tell if it's food good or bad by its calorie count and its fat content. Um, it's complete nonsense. There is no real correlation and there are good and bad fats and there is good and bad calories, uh, foods, you know, we need to be focusing on the quality of, of food. And that's totally clear. Um, like the example I gave you of the, in the Zoe study of people given an identical calorie muffin. And some people react to that in a very different way and get a sugar dip and will overeat by 300 calories later in the day. Others won't. Um, if you describe food purely in terms of that, mm -hmm. uh, all calories are equal and you just gave everyone these bad, bad foods, you, you wouldn't know that, that this is what this effect they're having on mood and energy and everything else. So smoke screen that we just need to get rid of. And we need to start talking about quality of foods and what's whole food, you know, what's a whole plant food, not these uh, foods that are made uh, in a way to falsify real food. You know, they're, 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 they're they're designed to reformulate actual food uh, using fake ingredients, mm -hmm. extracts. And I think that's, you know, um, no one denies that calories exist, but, you know, we can go into the whole thing about why calorie, di calorie counting diets fail the vast majority of people. It will work for a few weeks, then your body just readjusts just as, uh, and bounces back the same way um, exercise for most people does the same um, because your body adapts mm -hmm. to that exercise. You know, we're not just furnaces, we're finely tuned machines that, that change. So these are concepts that have just stayed because of the, the market, the force of the calorie counting diet market, the force of the food industry trying to sell us um, worse and worse food with more and more health claims. Mm -hmm. And I think the science is now uh, out there to show how sort of irrelevant they are and how they are just a smokescreen. Yeah, it, it, there's sort of a, an arms race also because as the public becomes increasingly more and more aware of the, the ills of ultra processed foods, at the same time, the giant conglomerate food companies are getting better and better and better at dialing in palatability and the addictive nature of these foods with the exact recipe or combination of salt, sugar, and fat to kind of light up the dopamine centers and make it impossible to just have one. So it creates this, this sort of compulsive relationship with foods we know are not good for us and yet we find ourselves powerless to deny, right? So education takes us to a certain place and, you know, human frailty and weakness, uh, you know, accounts for the rest. So, you know, it's, it's, it's yeah. sticky to like- well, I've got no, yeah. I don't really have a beef with foods that are obviously unhealthy, but super tasty, right? Um, 
but when something is wrapped up in a in in all this healthy packaging and is sold to you as a healthy low calorie mm. low fat alternative uh, that's you know that's criminal mm -hmm. um, it's 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 like dressing up cigarettes as uh, as healthy because they they're low in like it used to be low tar or low nicotine, therefore they're fine. You know, right? They're yeah, that's time. that's We've like a, that the now, sort of the tobacco like... company version of greenwashing. It makes us just feel a little bit better about that purchase. You know, making that purchase. Exactly. So, you know, let's have. We're not going to get rid of them, but let's let's have them with health warnings. Let's have them with a tax that reflects the huge burden on the on the taxpayer that all these foods are costing us. You know, so it's hundreds of billions of dollars a year um, just because of we're eating these foods. And why should the taxpayer be basically paying for all this when the food companies are making all the money and, and you know and they're getting massive subsidies to do it? And whereas Anyone producing whole plants and fruits is not getting the, those same subsidies. Right. It's wrong. You, right. I mean, I agree with you completely, uh, but then it becomes a question of political will and kind of penetrating the, you know, the battalion of lobbyists who are, you know, very invested in the status quo. Yeah, so it's, well, while, while, while well, we're all getting yeah. diabetes and becoming obese and dying there will of be a point when the country illnesses. just won't be able to afford it. You know, the healthcare system is broken. So it's, it is, and it's a national, it becomes a national security issue, honestly. Like it, it's, it's a really huge problem and yet it continues to persist and, and metastasize, which is disturbing. But perhaps we can, you know, pivot to a more optimistic or, or, or helpful uh, conversation around like how to guide people towards those better choices. I mean, we all know more fruit, more fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, you know, that's the kind of thumbnail, but for the, the, the conscious consumer who's just going to the supermarket and shopping for their family and is on some level of budget, what are some of the kind of guiding principles about what to avoid and, and you know, what to invest in? Well, there's a lot to avoid, um, but there were, in writing the book, I, there were some surprising findings that I, I found that things that are relatively cheap that aren't always aren't always unhealthy. So, things in cans. Um, many studies have shown that some canned tomatoes can have uh, higher nutrient levels than uh, fresh tomatoes, for example. Um, get a can of beans. They're just as healthy as um, getting your know, dried beans and uh, doing them yourself, and they're often extremely cheap, really good source of protein. Mm -hmm. Most frozen vegetables and berries are also highly nutritious uh, and really good for you and cost virtually nothing. So um, we tend to think of anything frozen or in cans or in packaging as all the same, but it's absolutely not true. As long as the, the source it is, it doesn't have, you know, uh, an artificial source in it, it's going to be really good for you. So that that was a surprising finding for that many of these these products you can get out of season. Frozen berries, for example, out of the freezer, are really good for you. Um, nuts and you know, there's nothing wrong with nuts as a snack, um, and there's a big difference between um, some artificially created um, uh, snacks like, I don't know, you know, things like Pringles, which mm -hmm. have very little potato in them. They're actually made of all kinds of a composite of other things versus some artisan potato chips that you can get that only have potato and olive oil or sunflower oil. Um, so there are some surprising ones in there, but uh, the jar Unfortunately, the vast majority of ready meals uh, that you buy have large lists of ingredients in them that you can't, wouldn't find in your home. And they're the ones that will cause you problems, they will make you overeat, and they will be bad for your gut microbes. And I think that's a really important educational message that needs to get out there is that it's not about the fat, it's not about the calories. It's the fact they have this really harmful effect on your immune system mm -hmm. and you're going to eat more and more of them. So they might be cheaper, but you're going to, they're, they're made for a purpose so that you'll be overeating your family uh, and you will put on weight and have all these other diseases. So I think it's this education about what's wrong with certain foods that are, you know, ultra refined, 
you have the fiber, very little nutrients, get into your bloodstream quickly, don't fill you up. And uh, they're just plain wrong. We weren't designed by evolution to eat them. Right. And, uh, that, so to my mind, it's, it's, it's an educational um, way of thinking, but realizing there are some, you know, things that look quite similar that actually are still very good for people, but they're, they're not eating. Yeah. Um, your dietary perspective and, and recommendations, although very plant focused and kind of plant centric are not ideologically sort of driven and, and they're not um, super strict in that regard. They're more like, this is what looks like the science supports and this is what I'm you know, advising you to do and not do. And an added wrinkle on top of that that I found really interesting in the book is addressing not only um, how the food is prepared, like have you cooked it? Is it better to eat raw? Or this is stuff I've thought about often. Like, should I eat this vegetable raw or is it better cooked? Is it better to light? What happens if you overcook it? Am I destroying all the nutrients in it? Um, and then also, how is the food packaged? What is the impact of you know food that's wrapped in plastic? And particularly if you end up like heating that food up while it's in the plastic, and you kind of address all of these, which I think are you know kind of common questions we all think about, but maybe don't pay enough attention about. So can you kind of unravel some of that? Uh, well, it's a lot to unravel. Yeah, so, I mean, there's um, I, I, it I, is. I, I mean, I, you I, can read the book, but like maybe some sort of general principles around that. Yeah, well, I, I think a lot of it comes down to understanding a bit more about the structure of food and um, cooking changes the structure of food. So, yeah, there was a common misconception that raw food is better for you, and the raw food movement has you know, led a lot of this. And but all the science suggests that actually lightly cooking food is the optimal. Uh, so lightly steaming your food breaks down the structures, allows the mm -hmm. nutrients to come out without destroying some of these um, vitamins and, and nutrients. And these polyphenols we talk about, these defense chemicals um, that are in all plants that are really rocket fuel for our gut microbes that are really what we should all be trying to get more of that definitely aren't in ultra processed foods. So Understanding the structure of food and how you're cooking is really important. Understanding that you know freezing stuff, even microwaving, is fine. Um, before I researched the book, I was oh, you know, I'd got rid of my microwave. Mm -hmm. I thought this is terrible, you know. It's sort of, um, but it, it turns out that actually uh, it doesn't destroy nutrients in any way. It's actually good and it's much better for the planet. Um, so in terms of the energy used, you know, if you uh, say a baked potato in a, in a microwave, it's much more efficient for climate change to use from it an en energy expenditure energy perspective. Energy expenditure perspective. Yeah, still, it may not like, taste as good. I still struggle with the idea good. of like having a microwave, but go but, ahead. But it, well, I was like you, you know, yeah. I said, uh, <laughs> but in a way, having researched the book, I've said, well, if I care about the planet, I should use both of these tools, you know, and, um, and not be so obsessed with uh, uh, my prior beliefs. So structured food's important, how you cook it's important, what you cook it with, so just combining foods together will change their, mm -hmm. um, uh, their nutrient value as well. So a lot of these Mediterranean dishes would use olive oil and garlic and onions. You know, collectively, they actually produce many more healthy chemicals together than they do when you have them alone. Chopping up your garlic uh, 10 minutes before you use it actually uh, trebles the amount of um, these uh, really beneficial nutrients in the, in the garlic that otherwise would get broken down. So these, all these kind of funny, weird stuff about structure of food uh, is useful for people to know in everyday life about mm -hmm. how to cook things. Um, yeah, obviously, cooking stuff close to plastics, and, and you've alluded to some of this, you know, the problem of microplastics is something we should be aware of. We don't really know enough about it, except there's lots, far too much plastic around, and so limiting the plastic that's close to our food um, is also important. Um, and I, I think the other thing I... I uh, realizes that no one had really written a book before that looks at all the different food groups and first takes health, um, then takes the ethics. So, you know, 
were animals, you know, injured? What's what's the what's mm -hmm. the the ethical basis of that, or what's a lot of there's a lot of new stuff about child slave labor, for example, chocolate and that, and uh, coffee and various other mm -hmm. uh, tropical things that we need to be aware of. Palm but also, oil. finally, the the big other area is the environment. Sure. And it was a bit of an eye opener for me because it's quite hard often to balance these three things when you're making, you're going into a store and you want to buy something nice and you're trying to work out all of, you know, to get all three. Uh, perfectly aligned at the same time is kind of tough and so and it, particularly when it comes to something like uh, artificial milks so mm -hmm. I found that really interesting because I'd experimented uh, with cutting out dairy milk and the main reason for me to cut out uh, dairy is because of its harmful effect on the planet when you calculate how many cows and methane and land land use, etc. So it makes obvious sense to cut that out. So I switched to oat milk, which, you know, I didn't mind the taste of it, seemed quite good. But then I put a CGM on me while I was drinking oat milk and I saw it shoot up. So suddenly I've swapped what was this reasonably healthy um, fat, mild sugar mixture for a, a, a much higher sugar, much more refined product uh, meant that if I was having regular uh, oat milk, it would, for me it would be bad. Other people might be fine, but it would, that would be, be better for the planet if we all switched to oat mm -hmm. milk. But it would probably cause more, um, d have some disease consequences as well. So there are lots of examples of how tough it is to balance some of these things and you know are you going to get them from mexico every every week are you gonna how do you freeze them enough and and where do you get the nuts from so it starts to ask a lot of questions not we don't have all the answers but i think it it made me think and i want people to read the book to to think about food in a very different way because the food choices we make every day are the most important choices we make for our health and probably also for the planet. Yeah, 100%. I mean, every every purchase of food that you make is a vote for the world, you know, that that, you know, will be, right? So, it would be great if there was some kind of metric or carbon score or some numerical value that we could attribute to each food, you know, sort of product, food product that we buy that would kind of tally, like, what is the carbon footprint of this? You know, what went into the, the manufacturing and distribution of this? You know, what was the, the um, amount of, like, water and acreage and, you know, all of that. Well, we, and, you know, we, were we animals killed in this? Or, were, like, oh. you know, so it, it's, it's impossible mm. to put all that on the consumer and expect them to, like, really be able to make an informed decision, especially when the larger food companies are doing their best to obscure any kind of transparency around that. Well, there are academics who have produced scores and we're working with them at Zoe and we do have a, a sort of beta score for all the common foods mm. that gives you an environmental index. And obviously the Zoe program is designed so that you, you know, you get your a, a general Zoe score and I've got my scores in the book for various things which is a combination of the three but so we're we're thinking uh, sometime in the near future of adding in that fourth score which would be the environmental impact score so mm. that people who wanted to uh, prioritize environment above health um, or have it as a major factor could actually have that but it is so complicated it would need it does need algorithms and, and an app you can't retain all of this stuff in your head knowing yeah. if that avocado comes from Mexico or it came from California you know what's the difference or you know and also it, labeling is not reliable it could you know all the all the the obscurant language around labeling you think you're buying something that was grown in a certain way oh, yeah. and you know it most likely wasn't and that opens up a conversation around you know a different um you know, a different component of of the microbiome, which is the sensitivity of our of our, you know, larger microbiome, not just to the foods that we're eating, 
but to uh, environmental toxins, the air that we breathe, the personal care products that we use, skin cream, shampoos, et cetera. And not for nothing, the pesticides that find their way onto the foods that, that we're eating that we're not even aware we're consuming, whether we're washing them or not. Um, and there's a spectrum of, of harm associated with that. But you know, how do you think about that and have their been studies done to give us a real grounded scientific sense of the harm or lack of harm? Like what is the level of concern that we should have around that? Well, in researching the book, I mean, obviously looked at things like glyphosate and herbicides in particular, because I was wanting to look at exposures that nearly everyone has had. And the problem with this kind of study is pretty hard to find people who haven't been exposed. Mm -hmm because whether you live in a rural area and there's lots of spraying around you or you eat a lot of vegetables or you eat breakfast cereal, we all you're going to be... Glyphosate coursing through our veins. All of us have yeah. glyphosate. And yes, the studies have shown that if you have organic food, uh, it has a fifth of the glyphosate levels of non-organic food, but you're still getting some. So everyone's exposed to some love. Because it's just blowing around in the wind from the neighboring farm and finds its way into the soil of the, or of the organic farm. And obviously, as I start to eat more plants, I get a bit more nervous about this because <laughs> you don't get glyphosate on beef, for example, or, you know, um, or meat. Or you get a whole bunch of other, other stuff, stuff, though. But, but, you know, so it's, but you're obviously compensated by you're eating lots of plants and vegetables, think you're doing the right thing. But if it's not organic, you are actually ingesting more glyphosate. And uh, I... I certainly realize there are also certain types of plant where you get more, many more. So if you like oats, and I know Americans love their oatmeal uh, in the morning, think it's a healthy food. Um, it has hu really high levels of glyphosate when the people have tested breakfast cereals because oats and rye, to dry them out, they, they'd spray it out as a way of harvesting it quicker. So used for different purposes. So I have a real problem with something that we're ingesting every single day of our lives what effect that has on our bodies. Now, the science isn't, the epidemiology isn't conclusive. There's a suggestion that it inc in increases lymphomas and there, are some, there have been some court cases on that. Um, it, they've done some mouse studies that show that uh, it, it does affect the gut microbiome because these, these uh, chemicals were designed so they didn't affect human genes. So they don't, uh, not supposed to interact with human genes, but they're supposed to kill uh, plant genes, and they, and as collateral damage, they take out uh, quite a few of our microbial uh, genes as well. So we are seeing disruption in the gut microbiome due to glyphosates, and the uh, animal models have shown that they do produce abnormal chemicals. Now, that's really all we know at the moment. Um, so there's nothing definitive but is sufficient to worry about. And there have been epidemiology studies, such as one in France, where they compared a group of people having organic foods uh, regularly versus non-organic foods and found big differences in cancer and um, uh, mortality levels mm. over, over the next 10 years. So there's enough for me to worry about. Um, I'm also worried about microplastics, um, I think we don't understand that and they, we do know that they do get into our gut and can cause disruption in our, in our gut microbes as well. And um, they're also enough if you eat a lot of fish, you know, because you think fish are healthy mm -hmm. and they go into that in the book. Um, Mercury. Be eating, and if you go to a nice non-sentient fish like mussels uh, and say, okay, I can eat those. They're great. They're really healthy, nutritious, but they've got a lot of microplastic in them because they yeah. they suck it out of the sea. So we're sort of screwing up our planet slowly. So all these good things um, we're having a problem with. But uh, so you know, I I think the, there is pretty clear evidence that um, these pesticides, etc., and uh, that are bad for newborn babies and and pregnant women, and increase. They've done some small scale studies. Evidence for the whole population isn't yet definite, but certainly if you can afford it, then um, definitely go, go organic. 
is is my advice. It's it, and unfortunately, in most countries, it's still more expensive, mm. and uh, mm-hmm. that, that's a problem. But yeah. I, I do worry about that. But having said that, it's still better to eat vegetables uh, and uh, wor- not worry about the pesticides than not eat the vegetables and the, the fruits. Yeah, and you can go to the environmental working groups list of the dirty dozen. There's a spectrum of of, of harm with respect to that. If you're budget conscious about what what's the most important food group to be organic versus conventional. But it, yeah, but it be, for your breakfast cereal in the, in the U S is one of the biggest uh, sources. Well, you should just get rid of that, of that. Do exactly. Like, just cross so it off the list. I think right? we, can, we can agree. <laughs> have a health warning, like a cigarette packet. And then right. say, yeah, if you have this at your own risk, you can't sue us if you get cancer. Um, what is your thoughts a big piece of let me preface this by saying uh, I think I think you know the scientific consensus is pretty clear that if you want that you want a healthy microbiome that having a robust and healthy microbiome is so crucial to so many facets of health and we're only uh, and and that and that the level of that um, relationship and importance is only growing as more science is coming out and a key component to maintaining the robustness of that, ecology is a diversity of plants in your diet. You talked about 30 plants a week, um, eating a diet that's high in fiber, uh, that is high in prebiotics and fermented foods, which are probiotics, et cetera. Um, And with that, what is your response to this growing uh, enthusiasm around what's being called the carnivore diet, which is a diet that is, if not exclusively meat, is almost entirely meat-based? There's a lot of people, particularly on the internet, who are espousing the benefits of that, saying how much better they feel, how it helped them resolve whatever kind of chronic ailment they had. Um, And this seems to be more than a fad at the moment. Like there's a lot of people who are um, very enthusiastically, uh, you know, sharing their anecdotal experience with this. Well, the good good side of it is generally these people are not having ultra processed foods. Agreed. So they are doing some good in that. Where, uh, and I, I also get people saying I've been on a carnivore diet for two years I feel great you know what are you talking about you need all these plants um, we do know that people who don't eat plants a variety of plants have less diverse gut microbes their microbial health is is generally poor which means they will uh, have a poorer immune system and so my my worry about the carnivore diet is that it is it may work short term they might feel better and so, not everybody i know some people who really can't tolerate those those levels of uh, meat or fats and we know this is there's individual variation so there are some people who can tolerate it and for, for a short while will feel better might lose weight might feel they're getting you know they're feeling stronger etc and that, that i think that's genuine but long term they're going to be causing harm to their system their immune system because they're not nourishing those gut microbes they're you know the average american has you know only half the, the microbial species of say that had a hunter mm-hmm. our ancestors through antibiotics through poor foods or ultra processed foods etc cetera, etc cetera. so they're going to be denuding that even more and so that means their armory of chemicals that they can use to fight infections to help um, negotiate their energy balance their metabolism etc is going to be used up so whenever they have a problem they're going to they're going to be in trouble they just won't have the tools to be able to uh, deal with it and have an immune system that i think is going to be wanting for most people i'm not saying there are some rare individuals who might be able to get by for longer than others without this problem in general it's a problem and i think the other misconception is this is what our ancestors ate i mean i spent a week with the hadza tribe um about uh, five or six years ago and saw at first hand what these hunter gathers in tanzania mm-hmm. what they actually eat and uh, you know i ate exactly as they did and you know i was filled up 
at about 10 o'clock with baobab porridge, which is um, this, it just falls off the trees and you mash it up with a bit of water and that's your, that huge high fiber mass. You can't stop farting after that. You know, you're just so full of fiber. You're eating berries. And then at, at lunchtime, you'd have, the, the women would dig up tubers, um, which are like, you know, uh, old uh, ancient yams, like a sort of form of sweet potato, and that would be um, the lunch. And then the guys would go out and do a bit of hunting, and on top of that, they would bring back some meat if they if they found any. But for large periods of the year, they'd be having no meat, uh, and the, most of their calories would come from the carbohydrates. Mm-hmm. And if there was honey around, they they didn't want meat. They just uh, they just went for the honey. They just uh, they stopped hunting completely. They uh, you know just satiated themselves on the honey. So it's, people have a very different uh, perception of what our ancestors were actually doing, and the majority of what their their food w- is, you know, was was plant based uh, and carbohydrate based. It wasn't a high protein, high fat diet. And they have the healthiest gut microbes. They don't get chronic diseases. They never get cancer. All, all these things that we've now developed as part of the West. So, mm-hmm. so the Hatta is, for people that don't know, uh, an African traditional hunter-gatherer tribe that has been able, for the most part, to maintain their lifestyle and their traditions amidst a rapidly kind of encroaching, developing world. And they have the most robust microbiomes because they have a very robust environment and extremely diverse uh, uh, amount of plant life on which they, you know, pers- they, they sort of persist and exist, right? Um, but it's 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 it feels like there's a there's a deadline on that. Uh, when I don't know when were you there? Like it, it, it like it's the world is encroaching on them, right? And some of their traditions are beginning to erode, and their dietary habits are are starting to kind of shift as a result of that. Yeah, which is awful. The area they're yeah. in is getting squashed by yeah. people cutting down trees around mm-hmm. them and pastoralists moving in, and of course, you know. They've got all these researchers around them now. Uh, right, everybody yeah. wants to study. I have a guy coming in tomorrow who went down and lived with them also. Yes. Uh, so, for different uh, reasons, but yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, hopefully they will survive a bit longer, but it, they're sort of running out of room. Mm-hmm. And uh, they are the last true hunter-gatherer tribe, really, in um, in Africa. And uh, it, But I think it's really important we do learn the lessons from them and we've learned so much about sleep and exercise and calorie burning and all these amazing things that have gone counterintuitive to what we we believed we thought you know um the fact they don't burn uh, many more calories than you know, we do and you know um and they're not you know they're not running all the time either you know no, they, they, and they're happier and they're more connected to their community and their neighbors and their family members and i think for the most part anybody i know that's had any contact with them said you know basically they're they're happy they're, go lucky they're doing guys. it a lot better than we are exactly and there's you don't, you don't see obesity you don't see diabetes mm-hmm. you know and they die when they fall out of trees or they get um, hit by animals so you know it's not they don't live to a ripe old age, but um, they don't really have a concept of age. And uh, it was just interesting, and you know, it was fascinating to see them. You know, I asked them, "When do you have breakfast?" And they didn't have a word for breakfast. So uh, this is again, a, you know, an invention of perhaps Kellogg's that mm. we all have to have breakfast, and uh, otherwise, you know, we're we're not um, eating healthily. And so, it, you know, it is this last chance to see how. Uh, we did evolve for, and I think they've been there for, you know, at least 15,000 years or in, in that similar sort of environment, which is, you know, where we're supposed to evolve from, you know, around mm-hmm. the equator. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a pity, but um, yeah, we've learned a lot from them. And I, I certainly did. My microbes actually... Um, uh, you tested before and after, right? Yeah, no, so uh, and I, I was eating everything they had, so the baobab, the yam. But you know, we, one day we, you know, it was porcupine was on the menu. So you know, um, which is not something you get regularly, and um, various other animals that I had no idea what they were. But they they all got thrown on the barbecue. But 
it, we were surrounded by animals and dirt and um, they're the microbes as well. So I think part of this is also the environment that we've lost. Mm. As we moved into diversity. cities, everything's sterile. Yeah. You know, we're not... We need to go back to hugging trees and um, uh, getting back to nature. And that's why gardeners have better microbes than non-gardeners. You know, I think we also realize it, it's external as well as what we eat as well is important. But um, yeah, my microbes um, improved by about 30% in diversity while I was there. But when I got back on you know, airplane food on the way back, by, you know, by the time I got back to London, it, it had gone straight back to... Did you keep that culture though and store it for future uh, proliferation? I'm, yeah, I, I wouldn't have got through the security. I think <laughs> oh, <yeah. they're, laughs> 